Hi, everyone, and welcome to another usual Sunday talk within the Nine Sided Circle. I'm one of your two hosts, Noor Kyle. Along and with... I'm along with the other one of your two hosts, Mushtaq Ali, the skeptic. <laughs> yeah, we've just had a very lively conversation about various things that provoke a little bit of skepticism for, for many of us. Anywho, here we are. Uh, oh, yeah. I guess before we leap forward, we have to do a little bit of a YouTube spiel. Most of you have heard this before, but for those who have not, maybe you're new, maybe you've just been poking around a while, but thank you for joining us, all of you, whether you're joining us live or on YouTube. If you are joining us on YouTube, we would love it if we could get some interaction going. We have been encouraging people to leave comments, to reply to other people's comments, perhaps. Um, you know, if you enjoy what we have to offer, please do give us a thumbs up and let us know. And if you dislike it, eh, if you really need to, you can leave a thumbs down too, that's okay. We appreciate any and all feedback whatsoever, any interaction, really helps us build more of a presence here on YouTube. And if that's something you'd like us to support us in doing, we certainly appreciate that. So thank you. I guess we'll get into our topic. Do you have anything else I need to add though? Um, no, I think you did pretty well. <laughs> you could have been funnier. <laughs> Usually so I dump serious. the steel on him, yeah. yeah. But you know. I'm very strictly business right now. Let's say. That's true. You are. Um, so the topic, the topic is something that is, hmm, it's a handful, but Mishtaq is going to try to make it a handleable handful. We're going to be talking about the octave. And? And? The shock points. Yes. So. We're going to get a little bit Gurdjieffian, but this also goes beyond Gurdjieff, for sure. Oh, yeah. This goes way beyond Gurdjieff. People were talking about the octave and such, you know, 2,000 years before Gurdjieff, probably yeah. longer. Chris will be excited that we may get yeah, into some I, I said old to myself, <laughs> I said to myself, I bet you Chris is going to see the title of this and show up tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes. So... Would you like to get started, Mushtaq? If I must. Yeah, you must. So. <laughs> so cruel. A taskmaster. So. Gurdjieff talked about uh, two laws over and over again. The law of three and the law of seven. And... The law of seven is also known as the law of the octave. We've talked about the law of three in various different points, and uh, we don't need to go over that again. And we've talked about the law of seven. The thing about the octave is that it is, uh, when you understand it, and it's one of the two things that make up the Enneagram. That's, that's an important thing to know about it. And when you understand it, it is the way that you can know when the shit potentially is going to hit the fan in anything that you're doing and to avoid that shit. Because we don't want it. Avoid that shit. Avoid that yes. shit. Let's do that. And it's incredibly complicated the way Gurdjieff explained it. There, there are two main sources for this. One is um, Belzebub's Tales to His Children, uh, Chapter 40, which is uh, the planet Purgatory is what it's called. And that is um, Beelzebub's Tales, Tales to, to His, his grandson. grandson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, chapter 40. Why. Yeah. Chapter 40. Um, and trying to understand what the hell he's talking about when he's every other sentence contains one or two words that he made up and doesn't define uh, is a little bit maddening. And the other is chapter seven in, um, in search of the miraculous by Ospensky. 
as he uh, narrates his classes with Gurdjieff in their meetings in Moscow, which are, of course, originally written in Russian and then translated into English for those of us who don't speak Russian. And so it loses a little bit. But again, it's very difficult to understand what he's saying. They talk about the idea that at certain points, the octave deflects. It's like, what does that even mean, deflecting? You know, and they're like imagining this thing that is getting bent around in a circle and everything. And to me, that never made any sense. Um, you know, my background in understanding the octave came from sound and not visual. And uh, Ospensky being a mathematician, everything was vis vis visual uh, and uh, a pain in the butt. So while he talks about that in that way, we're going to try and talk about it in a way that doesn't use weird words that nobody's ever heard before and does not uh, require that you visualize these things that you should be hearing. And it doesn't use weird terms that have no place there, like the energy in the octave retards at these two points. That makes no sense. Why would the energy retard? What, what, are they, what do they mean by that? And the energy doesn't, in fact, retard. But I think I know how they got there because the way I finally began to understand this was going back to first principles. And the first principle in the West, anyway, for understanding the octave is an instrument called the monochord. Um, the monochord is basically a little box with one string on two bridges. And you also oftentimes have a third bridge that you can move around and stop the string at various points. Now, this is what Pythagoras used to figure out his uh, octave and probably people before him used it as well. Um, so what an octave is, what the, uh, what um, Gurdjieff refers to is the seven note major scale, that particular octave. And that is the one that you find most easily on a monochord. You pluck the thing, and you get the tonic, uh, the fundamental note, um, which, you know, if we look at the keys of the, the piano, the easiest way to see this is on a piano because you have all of these white keys and in between some of them are black keys, except in two spots. And if you, yeah, like that, if you play, uh, say something so that can get over, Noor. Okay, sure. So. Uh, here's a visual for everyone. This is my digital keyboard on my screen. Let me actually turn this. Yeah, I think you guys can see that well enough, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So we have the white keys here, black keys up here. So that's what he's talking about. All right. And as you can see, you know, here we have a starting note. And then we have, as we'll discuss, we have these two spots where there aren't any black keys. That's going to be important as we go forward. Yes. Now, what happens when you pluck a string is that you do not get a pure note. Uh, if you want to hear a pure note, you have to listen to a uh, like a synthesizer or something that will just generate a sine wave in the audible range. And it's a very, very um, uninteresting note. What makes a note interesting is that you have the fundamental, but you have all of the overtones as well. And those overtones, some of them will be stronger, some of them will be weaker, and that's what gives any instrument its particular sound. So I've got like two or three flutes around here and I can hit the same note on all of them and they don't sound the same. You know, the neigh sounds uh, 
very interesting and breathy and the penny whistle is sharp and bright um, and the thing is those overtones are always in a particular ratio and when he talks about well Gurdjieff talks about these these things he called stopenders and these are the places on the octave that have gravity, according to him. And they also, the stopender has interval to it. It has space distance. What he's talking about is the, the spaces between the harmonics on a string. Now, if I take a monochord or a guitar and I pluck a string and I have a, a hard metal device or glass device, a slide basically, for those of you who know what that is. I can put it on the string and move it up. And the sound of the string will go up in pitch as I move it because I'm shortening the string uh, by using the, the slide as a bridge. Now, if I just go from uh, one end to the other, it's going to go up in volume and then stop when I reach the other bridge. But if I stop it in the middle, you will have the octave note. So if the, the string is tuned to uh, A2, which is um, A220, in the middle of that string, if I put that bridge there, it will be A440, which is one octave above. And you pluck it and you hear this like that. Yeah, so it rises in, in pitch, not in volume. I just yeah. wanted to, yeah, clarify yeah. that. So the natural places of the harmonics on the string do feel like they have some sort of gravity because when, you, when you're drawing the string up, when you're drawing the slide up the string, when you get to these spots, which are at particular ratios, uh, it wants to stay there because it sounds good there. You know, so if you move the string up an octave, that sounds good. Noor, play us an octave on your, your piano. All right, my little keyboard here. Yeah. Turn the volume on there. Don't need the metronome. Okay, so here we go. This is middle C. Can everyone hear that all right? Yep, heard it great. Okay. Okay, now just play middle C, C above middle C, just two notes. Sour note. Sorry. That's okay. That actually helps. So you all hear how that's that's the same note, only higher. Now, if we uh, that is literally the dividing the string in half. To find the next harmonic you divide the string in thirds. And what that gives you is what's called the perfect fifth. So nor if you would play a C and a G. I have them resonating a little bit too. Yeah, and that, that actually is good. Yeah. Now play the C, the G, and the C above middle C. Bum, bum. <laughs> yeah, right out of 2001. Yes. Now, most people will find that that group of notes, those vibrations, go together harmoniously. Right? Can we play that? <laughs> It fits. Um, 
So do we have a sense of that? Does that, uh, you, you kind of understand it? Nodding up and down means yes. Shaking back and forth means no. And the ratio for that is three over two. Um, so the do note, which is C in this case is one, one, then three, two, and then two, one. That's how you, you would mark it for the, the tonic, the perfect fifth and the octic octave. So I can't talk today. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, if you divide that string into quarters, into four parts instead of three, you get another note, which is actually F. To keep it within the octave, you have to drop it down rather than up. So if you play C and F, that's called a perfect fourth. So, yeah, play C, F, and C. And we begin to form chords. And then there's all these other intervals that you find in the same way, sliding the, uh, the slide up the string and finding the places that it sounds good to stop. That's the best way I can explain it. And they form these mathematical ratios. And it's very cool. And I have to tell you, and Nora can attest to this, that when I get into this, you know, I'm doing my a little bit of brushing up before this talk, I get totally lost in the math of, of this. It is utterly fascinating to me. Fascinating to him, a little bit overwhelming for me. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so this is what the octave is made out of. And there's a, a, a couple of different ways to make it. What we're looking at is what's called just intonation. And it is a method of arranging the octave that goes back probably thousands of years. Um, and it's pretty ubiquitous. Um, it's very, very similar to uh, Indian music notation, how they, they note the seven notes. There's, there's a tiny little difference in one of the notes, but uh, you hear the same major scale in the old traditional Indian music, but they are, were smart enough to figure out the 22 semitones before anybody else. We thought that we were really cool to, to do it, you know, like, 1500 years ago and they've been playing those 22 notes for 3000 years, maybe more. So this is not anything new. Uh, and I promised myself I wouldn't get off on these tangents. So Noor, crack that whip. <laughs> yes, I will do that. So we have a question from David mm -hmm. and much enthusiasm from Chris about Pythagoras, of course. But um, David asks, how many parts do you have to divide the string in order to get to E in C? Okay. Um, trying to remember what that is. I think that's the minor third. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, the me note, the me and fa, I'm pretty sure that me is, yeah. So it's a couple of more divisions. And the thing is, as you're figuring this out, like one way to figure this out is called the circle of fifths where you divide the fifths into themselves over and over again. 
and eventually because you transpose down when you get above the octave it gives you all of your notes including the semitones uh, but we will get to that later but yeah it, it takes a couple of more divisions to get to uh, to, to E or to A Now, if you play uh, C, E, is it C, E, G or C, E? Are you trying play? to get like? Yeah, major chord. Yeah, there's your, there's your major, uh, major uh, four, four note chord. Yeah, and that contains the E that you're you're asking about. So it comes in right about there. <laughs> it's probably more obscure than we want. At least for today. Yeah. Yeah. So before I go on, are there any other questions? I had a comment. Yeah. Go for it. And a kind of a question. When I'm hearing the notes play, like a, a C and then the next C, mm -hmm. they sound like they're related. There's a little, a strong relation between them. Yes. And then when I'm hearing like C, G, C, there's still a relation, but it's, it's fainter. And then CFC was an even fainter relation, but still they, they go nicely together. Yes. Could could it be, could a parallel be like siblings in a family? Versus yeah, kind of. Like cousin versus cousins? Yeah, or even uh, strangely, strangely related brothers and sisters. Hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's that's not a bad metaphor because they are like blood kin. If you stop the notes at the places where you don't have harmonics, it sounds bad. And unfortunately, I don't have any stringed instruments here to show you, and you're probably lucky that that's the case. Um, but... If it's not hitting on a harmonic, whether it is a, one of the major harmonics or one of the more minor harmonics, um, it doesn't sound good. So when we hear this, we often say it sounds in tune. And that's what in tune sounds like. We're in harmony. Yeah. Uh, when I tune a guitar, or any of the stringed instruments that I've been known to play, one of the my favorite ways to tune it is using the harmonics of one of the strings. Yeah, I've done that yeah. with my wire too. Yeah, yeah. That's right. You have a wire. I could have I gotten thought, that yeah. out. Yeah, you can't do the whole scale on it though, because I don't have enough. No, yeah. uh, doesn't matter. I could do the whole scale on one string. Mm. Uh, Yeah, and drive people crazy by actually hitting some of the the uh, disharmonic points on the string. <laughs> but that's for another time. Um, so there's this, this fascinating thing that happens with just intonation and Pythagorean tuning, which is another form of just intonation. Just intonation means that the notes are exactly where they're supposed to be according to the harmonic. We don't use just intonation very much these days. What we use is a, a tuning scheme called even temperament. And the reason that we use it is because the further away you get from your home octave, the more out of pitch the notes get. And so with... Uh, 
with the Pythagorean tuning, uh, when you're going around the circle of fifths to find your various notes, they actually have a name for this spot. It's called uh, the wolf interval, as in snarl, growl, because it is completely dissonant to everything else, even though it is exactly where the math says it should be. Now, this, when Gurdjieff is talking about the octave deflecting, this is what he actually means. I'm pretty sure what he actually meant. He just didn't have the words to talk about it or didn't want to talk about it that way. There is a natural tendency for the octave to get out of tune at certain points. And when we understand that, we, we understand that in order to keep the octave in tune, we have to either uh, we have to add a little something to it. So if I was playing my saws and one of the strings had dropped just slightly in pitch because they do go out of tune, especially when you're playing, especially when you're playing something important, especially when the audience is looking at you, I could bring it back into pitch by just bending the string a little bit, pulling on it to tighten it uh, for that note. That's one way to do it. So I'm adding something to that note. I'm adding a little bit of energy to the string to bring it back into pitch and to keep it in the key. Now, what Gurdjieff observed is that the, the places where you don't have black keys on the piano, these are half steps. Um, I'm going to pull up a graphic for you to look at. Okay. Um, there we go. But what he's mentioning is what I showed you earlier with these breaks in the black keys. So we're going to come back to that. So here we have a major scale octave. And we have these relationships. These are the intervals that you get. And there's ways to like add these intervals together to find out what the difference is between these. And I didn't want to go into those tonight. I did this in these squares so that you can see the difference in the intervals visually. And I did them in the basic color spectrum because octaves like this are ubiquitous through nature from ener with energy of any sort whether it's a sound vibration or a light vibration or any other kind of vibration you can think of, the periodic table of elements arranges itself naturally into octaves. It's kind of weird. So as you can see, there are these two short spots right here. And Gurdjieff says that the energy retards at these places. It doesn't really retard. It just... Um, would you play uh, on the piano uh, the the interval between me and Fa? Sure. I'm just gonna put this on. Yeah, I'll play it. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, actually, okay. yeah. Now play Do Re. So you can hear that. And then we fall. You hear the difference between those two? Now play the ratio between C and Do. The interval, you mean? Yeah, the interval.
Okay, now play that whole octave again, but stop at C. Don't hit the uh, the don't hit the octave note. What does that feel like? That last bit. Zena, what does it feel like to you? Uh, feels like unfinished, like you want to jump up, but yes. you don't. Pretty much everybody on the planet who can hear experiences that that interval between the C and the Do, if you don't finish it, it's like you sit there and you want to do this. It's just like floating out in space unresolved. That's, that's you know, if I think about performing a song, um, there's a sense that, okay, there's, there's a finishing up that needs to be done. <laughs> Unless you're leaving it there for dramatic effect somehow, you know, like there's this. And then your audience will hate you. <laughs> they might. They might. They might. They might not appreciate that sense of tenuousness. So, play, uh, re mi fa, for me. Uh, You notice you get a little bit of that there, but it's much stronger at the C do. It's got this edge to it. Yeah. Now the last three notes. <laughs> yes. So those intervals, those half tones have an actual effect on us. You notice that, right? Is anybody not noticing that that actually kind of affects you? Yes, no, maybe. Chris, what are you experiencing? I mean, the, the same thing about the unresolved, I uh, really felt that. And then when it was resolved, uh, there's a feeling of resolution. I felt sense of that. Yeah. So I am pretty sure that what Gurdjieff was referring to with the retardation of the octave at these points was that sense of lack of resolution. Now, in order to get the resolution, you have to add a little something, which in this case is like the next note um, in the series, in the harmonic series, uh, or in the octave series. Um, and it brings it to a resolution until you get to the next half step. And then it is even more powerful. And you have a more powerful need to the resolution. And this is the two shock points in the octave. The rule is that in order to get through the shock points in any octave, energy must come in from the outside to move it to its next step. Now, this is one of the things that the Enneagram is built on. They say the Enneagram is built on the law of seven, which is what we're talking about now, and the law of three, which is the triangle in it. And if you remember the Enneagram of the kitchen, the first shock is where food either enters or doesn't enter into the equation. And if the food, the food doesn't come into the kitchen from the kitchen, you have your kitchen ready for work. You have your quick kitchen starting to work. 
and then the food either arrives or it doesn't. And if it doesn't arrive, then there is no meal. So this is the sense of resolution uh, that the scale is looking for, that the octave is looking for at the first of these two shocks. The second shock is at six when the community enters. If the community, if the community doesn't enter, there is no purpose to what you're doing. And that is like the C do interval. If you if you end up at that C note, and you're that's S I, not not the letter C. If you end up at that C note, and um, yeah, you're you're waiting for the octave, you're waiting for the finish, and it doesn't happen, then everything falls apart. And you have that sense of the need to go. So rather than try and talk about deflections and, you know, making the octave try and go into a weird sort of circle and things like that, I want you to think about how it feels. Because the people who really understand and use this in their life, 100% of the time when I have talked to them, they feel for the shocks. They don't try and calculate where they are. They know when the shock is coming and they're expecting it when it gets there. And an old friend, his name was Rashad, and uh, he was really good at this. And he would say something like, hmm, I feel a shock in the air. And the next thing you know, a car would crash outside the house. You know, you'd have a fender bender, and he's like, oh, yeah, there's that. Now you could go, yeah, he knows that something's going to happen somewhere anytime he says something, but that's not necessarily true, because I used to try it back then. Oh, there's going to be a shock. Nothing happens, even if I'm looking for it. So, there, uh, there is something, too, feeling for that sense of uh, impending need for resolution. Mm. I see Jonathan's unmuted. Yes. Yeah. Talk to us. I've had the experience where I've cooked for people and the food's ready and the timing is so important and I'm, I'm ready for people to come and eat, but they're still talking and it feels so I can't get my satisfaction yeah. until they come to the table and, and eat, start eating the food. Well, not to mention the meal can be ruined if they don't show up at the right time. Right. So that tells you that in a proper meal, not only must you cook it consciously, but the guests must, must receive it consciously. Yeah, cooking a five-course uh, meal for people who are asleep can be unsatisfying. So that's a, a really good example. So what I'm trying to do here is not to baffle you with the bullshit, because that's what usually happens with all of the uh, the mathematics that gets thrown at you and the, the deflections and the retarding and all of that. I'm trying to find a way to explain to you how a regular person can do this without having to resort to the confusion. And the best way I know is to learn to feel for the shocks in your body like you feel that need for a transition from uh, the me to the fa or the si to the do. 
and you'll notice that the first one is kind of easy. You can let that happen. The second one is much, much harder if you don't get it to go. Now, the thing is, and this is where the Grigius talk of deflection comes in. If you don't get the energy to get through the octave uh, or to get through the shock point, your purpose begins to veer away from its actual intention. And that's why he talks about uh, after a while, the octaves go in, in circles. So if I get to the mi fa interval and I don't get the external energy I need to get through that shock, think of it as it going slightly out of tune. And then I try and play the octave from there until I get to the next shock. And because it's more out of tune, uh, it again bends the note so that um, I have to start a whole new octave in, with a new pitch. And this keeps going around, as Gurdjieff says, until it makes a full circle and comes back to where it starts, but is completely out of tune with what you started with. And that is his metaphor for what goes wrong with your intentions when you don't get through the shock points in your personal octaves. And so what we're talking about here is every time you set an intention, you're creating a tonic note. That's your do note. And you need to get it through till the next do, or maybe even a do after that, or a do after that to finish your intention. Because these octaves are nested one within the other. I mean, it kind of reminds me of singing a cappella, right? If you don't have yeah. a really internalized sense of what your starting note is, you do start to veer off and end up off key. Yeah. And maybe it's not you, but it could be someone else. Let's say you're in some kind of chorus or whatever, and you are all singing a cappella, and the person next to you is just a little bit off, and you start wanting to match them. So, you know, it's chaos at that point. It has begun to fall apart. <laughs> and you've lost that initial intention to stay with that, that starting note. And another way to think about it is, is with movement. So everybody's dancing, right? And you're following a beat. And one person is two tenths behind everybody else. So he's going. And you know what's going to happen after about three measures of that, right? That person will be totally off their mark. And they will not end up where everybody else ends up. And people will see that, like they will look at that and they will notice because perhaps they have connected with the beat for themselves. So they're kind of, they've got that, they're following along with it. And then something seems a little bit off. And it's, it's like hearing a note that's a little bit off. It's, it feels peculiar and you're like, something doesn't fit here. So here's the magic of this. Understanding this and understanding that no matter what you do, you are creative, you are creating octaves of uh, intention. You always know that you're going to have to bring a little energy into it to keep it from going out of tune. And the places where this is most likely to happen are at the Mi Fa and the Si Do intervals. Does that make sense? Seems like for most people it makes sense. For anyone, does it not make sense? It's okay to share that. Okay, I think we're doing good so far. 
Good. Because now we're going to talk about another part of this that doesn't get mentioned as often, and that is the descending octave. Mm. So, Noor, if you would please play the octave starting from second seed and go down to middle seed. Okay. So, C4 to just, C3. Just one point. Sure. Yes. How one can develop the capacity to feel the shock? The shock is coming. Um, hold on to that thought because that's what we're going to talk about next. That's the whole point of this talk <laughs> is to get to, to actually doing something practical with this. All right. So I'll do the descending skill. By the way, is that coming through okay? Because I have original sound off. Uh, it's coming through all right. Okay, it's not cutting. A couple off. of the notes were a little cut off. I'm gonna put the. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's already an improvement. So. You've heard the saying, as above, so below, right? Everybody's heard that, right? So this was the as above and the so below, right there. Now you'll notice that in the descending octave, the biggest uh, place where Gurdjieff would say the energy retards is in the beginning. And you can hear that need for resolution there. Well, you're starting out the gate with just yeah. the... Uh... Yeah, with the, the half tone. Yeah. So give the... Go through the half tone. So just the... Uh... Yeah. Now do the the first three. Do you hear that sense of resolution in the third note again? And the second half tone interval is much gentler. Uh, requires less energy. Yeah, go down three. So, this tells us something. When we are rising up towards heaven with our ascending octave, which is the, the human being's octave, the hardest bit is the last bit. When uh, heaven is coming down to us, the hardest bit is the first bit. You all get a sense of that? Pick a few nuts. Good. So, Jayesh, would you ask your question again? And <laughs> we can now address it. So, how to develop the capacity to uh, feel the shock? Okay, so the way I learned 
was first of all to try and calculate the shocks uh, using my intellect, which will not work, but it will hint at where the shock is liable to be. When you say calculate, you're just using your intellect. What do you mean by Think that? Think it through. Think it through. Like, hmm, where Logic would I it. expect it to show up? Yeah, literally. You know, look at an Enneagram and go, where are the first and second shocks on this Enneagram going to be? So that's mapping it out. Like, okay, step yeah. one. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that will help. But then when you start getting close to that, you have to turn your cogitating off and uh, let yourself feel for it. And so what I feel for is that same sense of lack of resolution that you get when playing those notes and stopping before you get through the half step intervals, stopping at the half step. That sense of this needs to be completed is what I look for. And that's going to be different for everybody, I'm pretty sure, but it's, it will be the, the thing. You will know when you find it that, oh, it's this. Once you do that, you have to ask yourself, what do I need to come in to resolve this? Because that's what it, it's actually called that in music. It's the resolution to the next step. So... What needs to be brought in to resolve this half step into its next whole step? And it's always going to be from outside of the process. And you can do this with any process. Start with the really simple, silly ones first, like the Enneagram of, or the octave of polishing your shoes. Or the octave of uh, going to the store. And you'll start finding these places where it's like, oh, there's where the energy needs to come in. That's what it is. And so you bring something in from the outside of that process to make it all happen. Like, for example, the, the uh, process of going to the store, the first shock is probably going to be, um, do I have the list of the things that I need? Because if you don't, and you get to the store, you don't know what to buy. The list may need to be written out. The list may need to be in your mind. Doesn't matter. It's do you have it? Because that's outside of the process of going to the store. The octave finishes when you get to the store. Then you start a new process, which is the process of buying food. And that's going to have the same sort of octave feel to it. And uh, the second resolution on buying food is getting to the checkout stand and reaching for your money. So and what would that your... second, second shock for uh, the reaching to the store? For getting to the store, the second shock is probably going to be if you drive, find a parking spot. Uh, it'll be something that needs a little oomph to it. I always walk to the store myself, and uh, so for me, the second shock is usually uh, I get three quarters of the way there and I get distracted by something and I have to pull myself back. And what, what I think of it as is looking for the places where I have to bend the notes a little bit. And listen to music. Notice how music resolves because that's going to give you the feeling in your body. And it doesn't, well, listen to good music. The older, the better. Um, you 
you know, three chord wonders are not going to help you out as much as either a symphony or uh, a really good uh, Turkish classical music or Indian music. Indian music is good because they play so much with the semitones that mm. you really begin to get a feel for those notes sliding up and down and how it changes the feel in your body. I think classical music in general tends yeah. to give more of that visceral feel like not that modern music doesn't have its own visceral feel but in terms of sensing the movement up and down a scale and the resolution of an octave that tends to happen more in classical music yeah and the more notes you have the more uh intense the feeling can be mm -hmm. Uh, which is why I like the uh, Turkish music. Iranian music is really good for that because they they play a lot with all of the semitones. Indian music, especially the really old Indian music with instruments that are designed to it or voices that have been trained to it that can just hit those tiny little 22 notes that uh, <laughs> we don't get to hear. Is that it will help. Yeah. I mean, I'm also thinking of how European opera um, tends to always end in in resolution of yep. an octave. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, something like the the flower duet from Lakshmi uh, is a really good example of of how uh, voices can. Uh, resolve these these octaves in in really beautiful harmonious ways so yeah listening to music is good i'm convinced that one of the reasons that uh, this was so hard to two reasons that this was so hard to understand one gurdjieff didn't want you to understand it he wanted you to have to struggle and Aspensky had a tin ear you know, he was a very, very visual person. He was not, he didn't have a deep auditory sense. So. So he wasn't equipped to talk about it like this. Is no. what you're saying. Yeah. No, no, he talked about it and Gurdjieff, baby Gurdjieff talked about it as well almost entirely in visual terms. Which is... When you look at the diagrams in uh, uh, in search of the miraculous, they're all mm. pictures of things bending and stuff. And it made no sense to me. I, I could not understand this until I began to listen rather than see. And so that's my tip for everybody. And I'm going to give you... Uh, Imagine that you're going to do something and you set the intention to do this thing and that's your tonic note. So, Nor, give us a C, middle C. There's your tonic note. Now play C up to me. That's all of your preparation. Then from me, uh, stop just below, just before C. That's your action. And then C do. That is your shock. So preparation, action, shock. And the second shock is always the doozy. On the way up, on an ascending. Yeah. 
on an ascending, yeah. Yeah. Jonathan. I don't know if this is a, a good example, but I was had the intention to wash my car this afternoon. So I gathered all the materials together, kicked kicked over the bucket of soap and had to go get another one. That would be anyway, your first find, shock? Maybe. But anyway, I finally washed the whole car. Then I said, ah, oh, do I want to wax this car? It's like, oh, I've, I've, I've washed it already. I've done what's it's important. It's clean. Do I really want to wax it? That was, to me, the second shock. That was really hard for me to go ahead and finish by waxing it. Yeah, that might have been uh, the beginning of a new octave, too. I wasn't there, so I can't say. So if you say that that was the second shock, I have to believe you. Yeah, if it were me, I would divide it up to, all right, I intend to wash my car. I've washed my car. Oh, there's another octave that I can in invoke. I intend to wax my car. I wax my car. Or I would do, I intend to wash and wax my car. Intention is flexible. So if you were to say, I intend to wash and wax my car, how would that map out? That would probably map out exactly like Jonathan said. Hmm. Yeah, that was my initial intention. Yeah. So do you all have a sense of how you can begin to hunt for the shocks? Have I been clear enough on that for you? Chris, you have a thought. Uh, yeah, well, more, more uh, a couple questions. So uh, I'm still missing exactly how the notes fall on the Enneagram. You know, um, do is so do is starting. It, you, you skipped the. You know, you only have you have less notes than you have spaces on the. Yeah. So take a look at how the kitchen is arranged on the Enneagram, and that will show you visually. And we did a whole video on the Enneagram of the kitchen, which will be found at the end of this talk. Um, but the Enneagram ends at seven or the, the, the octave ends at seven, uh, where seven returns to one. So those are do, right? Yeah. Seven That's, and there's one. A, yeah, there's a couple of ways to map out an octave on an Enneagram. And I prefer for most um, things that I need an Enneagram for, I prefer this method. There's another method where the three, the six, and the nine are the shock points. And then you have the six notes, which are the, the stuff with uh, the nine point being the do, the uh, beginning and the ending do. And then the shock points are in the wrong place, but they're there. Uh, the six shock is in the wrong place when you do it that way. And Jayesh has a thought. I see that finger up. As long as you're not yeah, about so, to shake it at me. <laughs> no. So uh, one thing is we uh, look or we feel, try to feel for the shock. And uh, is it like uh, if some, something is needed to be added from outside, uh, that is the point of shock? Yes. The point of shock is where if you don't bring in that something from outside the process to keep the process going, the process deflects. It goes off in a, in a wrong direction. You get a sour note. Right, so in the process itself, it is already defined that something needs to be added from outside and it, yeah. it is not getting in a timely manner, then there is a retardation or maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. And they say, and I, I don't know if this is objectively true, but I do know that it is subjectively true for me that every process I do has these two shocks in it, if I look hard enough for them. And that may be the secret is looking for them. You'll find them, whether they're there or not originally. 
Chris, did you have more thoughts you wanted to share? More questions? Not at this time. Okay. Damn it. I always <laughs> like your questions. At some point, you and I can get together and talk the mathematics of this for five or six hours. I'm jonesing <laughs> to do that. I, I, do, I do have uh, a lot of questions, but I think it'd be, it'll be sidebar. Yeah, that's that's what I realized uh, what day before yesterday, was it, Noor, when I said, I got to stay away from, I, I got to rein myself in because I was just down the rabbit hole with the math on this. And you were enjoying it, but for the sake oh, yeah. of this talk, we both knew that keeping it more simple would be a yeah. better fit. Yeah. I totally geek on that stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that, that makes you go, how the heck did the universe get arranged like that? Mm. Who thought of this? Very strange. Yeah. Very strange. But, you know, if I start talking with Noor and her eyes start glazing <laughs> over and crossing. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm more into the feel of it. I, as, as many of you know, you know, I do a lot of singing. So for me, that's how I connect with it. The numbers, I'm just like, ugh, I can't. I will eventually get that stuff down, but that is not what draws me in. That's for sure. Does anybody else have any thoughts? I might, I want to call in people and check in with them. Is that cool? Yeah. Shuri, how are you doing? I'm with you, no. I'm more, I'm more of a feely person. And when I feel uncomfortable, I know I've got to put something in behind it and not veer away mm. from what needs to be done or addressed or spoken. And, and that's the difficulty being a shy person, being someone who doesn't normally speak up, but learning to do that as I get older and knowing that I've got to look beyond that uncomfortableness. I've got to sit in that shock and realize it's not the end of the world. It's the next thing that to mm -hmm. actually um, seek out how to go to that next note to finish it. And every time you, know, you put that energy into it, it feels so good. But I was smiling at the beginning because I was thinking of how is it Steve Martin who was in that movie where he's adopted by a black family and he's just so out of tune and he can't yeah. It's so funny and I was laughing about that. That's all I could remember was how out of sync he was. <laughs> and that was pretty funny. And my dad, my dad couldn't sing in tune to save his life, but he was in his church choir and his enthusiasm was there. Oh, I know. Yeah, he stuck with that even though he couldn't hear himself, you know, he just dad but then you think well all the people in that group knew he was out of tune but they put more energy into staying in tune and i thought that sometimes that happens in life you've got people who are playing their hardest but man they just can't get past through that job you know just support them that you don't have to intervene yeah. but you, you just have to be supportive because sometimes it's just going to take a long time <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like me. I can sing any song in perfect pitch as long as the song only has one note. <laughs> yeah, you make a valiant effort, though, and it's very inspiring. Yeah, it's very frustrating, though, because, I mean, if I could, like, reincarnate somewhere it would have probably be in a family of musicians where I could have been trained in Carnatic singing from the time I could make a sound. <laughs> that would be like heaven to me. But you guys are just stuck with what you got. Sorry. We work with what we got. Yep. 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 <sighs> Mr. Keem, how are you doing with this? Yes, I'm, I'm not uh, very good in the music side of it, but I think I'm also interested with the math, mathematics side. Mm 
So I think maybe. Yeah, there. maybe you and me and Chris will get together at some point <laughs> and just go crazy. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm I'm not very good in the music side. Yeah, the math of this is incredible. You know, especially when you start bringing in the modes, and so the seven classical modes are where does the tonic start? So like um, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C is a major scale. But if you start that same sequence at uh, A, you get what's known as, uh, no, not the Ionian, uh, one of those scales, uh, Aeolian scale, A to A gives you a minor scale. Same exact notes, same exact half steps in the same exact place, but how you start it changes the way it feels. And there is something there for everybody when it comes to doing octaves. It's like, what note is your octave starting on? Is it starting on a major scale, a minor scale, a seventh? You know, where is it starting? What is it going to do? Because even though this all works with exactly the same notes, exactly the same vibrations, it sounds totally different. As a matter of fact, Nor, would you play major scale again? Now, play that same sequence, but start at A. I'll have to slide your keyboard down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So just start with A, you said? Yeah, start and finish with A. Okay, A4 to A5. Totally different feel. Every one of the classic modes puts the two half-step intervals in different positions, but same distance relative to each other. Yeah, so, I mean, you can see this is a little bit different from, yeah, yeah cause there's, it's moved a little bit more this yeah. way and as opposed to here. Yep. And every one of the modes has a different feel. <laughs> so is F. Yep. Yeah, so that's... <sighs> yeah, and you can, more than on the piano, you can see that on a, a straight pipe. So if you're playing the penny whistle or the bansari or any just open hold flute, um, you have to play in modes because you... you can't really play in chromatic keys in the same way because they'll go out of tune. So you just switch your modes, which is why most Irish music is done in the key of D because D penny whistle works with everything. But then they would have sharps in there and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, the key of D sounds exactly like the key of C, only up one step. Yep. And. Yeah, we won't worry about that right now. We won't worry about that. So each of these modes, if you can start music in modes, you can start your own personal octaves in modes too. And each of them will evoke a slightly different um sense of things 
like if I was going to use the aeolian mode of an octave, what would I use it for? Which one is that again? That's the the A to A. Mm. Minor key. What would you use a minor key for? Jonathan. When I heard that A to A, I felt that it, it sounded like you were asking a question. <laughs> That's interesting. It, it left, yeah, it was in a question yeah. unanswered. It was complete because it went yeah. from A to A, but it was unanswered. It was begging and... for something to, else to follow. Yeah. So, Noor, can you think of a song that's in a minor key? Oh, wow. Um... I can't right now, actually. How about Scarborough Fair? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's in a minor, minor key, and that asks a question. Yeah. Yeah. That totally asks, I mean, the song is about asking a question, right? <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting connection. I like that. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about it that way. I mean, I kind of think of it as like this, this, this kind of sometimes mystical, sometimes dirgy type sound. Yeah. It's a sound that can evoke a certain emotion. So like uh, the major key, which is the, is that Dorian? <laughs> Dorian or Ionian? I think it's, it's Ionian. Jayesh has to leave. Bye. Ah, Jayesh, take care. Good um, to see you. That, uh, it's a happy mode, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these modes have a different feel, and it has to do with what do you emphasize as the tonic in the mode? This is more advanced, but. Uh, this is definitely more advanced. Yeah. So just something to think about. I saw Chris had, a, had his, himself unmuted earlier. Uh, no, I was thinking for the Aeolian more, but for some reason I, I like, was uh, picturing it being Enneagram for something that you'd be like building. What was that last bit? Or, or like like building or making something with, with one's hands. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. I haven't heard from David or Levita yet. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Levita! No! <laughs> I am both simultaneously underwater and out to sea. Ooh. Um, if my music teacher was here, he would literally be on the floor laughing hysterically because he is an uber geek about this stuff. And every now and then I will ask a question and he will go, it's like this. And then he's gone. And I just, I'm just like this. Yeah. In a year or two, maybe I'll get it. Oh, so, I know. I know that feeling. I totally yeah, so, understand. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm, I, I find it fascinating, but I didn't learn this stuff when I was a kid. So I have, I am literally making bricks without straw or mud. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just listening and hoping that at some point it will click into place. It sounds fascinating. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. yeah. Drink it so, in. And, just yeah. remember, just remember that it is not about the numbers. It's about the feel. Mm. And that helps. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That, it, it doesn't hurt. I enjoy music. I enjoy listening to it. But when I decided to learn it, I realized I should have just stuck with listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, Levita, don't worry. <laughs> David, how about you? So um, for different processes, um, 
is there like a, a time frame for when the process starts to deflect? So it could be a very short time frame or a long It depends longer. on how long the process is. If right. you do a process that's a year long, the first deflection might not be for two, three months. But then, um, as Mr. Gurdjieff points out, each note has its own octave. So I was talking about the monochord, but you can, you can take that box and you can string eight strings on it. And this is where you really begin to hear the problem with uh, moving up and down octaves in just intonation. So my first string, I tune all of the other strings to the harmonics in my first string. Uh, and so they go from, um, you know, the tonic to the octave. Now, those first seven strings each have their own octave. And their octave is not going to be exactly in tune with the others for whatever reason. God was drunk that day. I don't know. <laughs> So, yeah, as you go along, there are octaves within octaves. And so even on a very long octave, each of the steps is going to have its own octave. And each of the steps within that is going to have its own octave. It's very fractal. What is life if not fractal? Yeah. When you two, Mustak and Noor, formed the intention for this talk. Did you have a conclusion of the intention in mind and have you achieved it this evening? Um, my conclusion for the intention, the intention was to give you guys a different way to look at the octave that didn't use all of the crazy words that Gurdjieff came up with and didn't use the stilted visual mathematics that Ospensky offered us and give you a felt sense of the shock points. So you tell me, did I achieve it? Yes, very much so. There you go. See, and, I can't say, you have to say. And might I suggest that the shock came from us and that we were intently listening to uh, what, you, what you had to say. Yeah. If you so, guys so weren't we into listening, we get, there would be no talk. <laughs> we didn't get deviated. No. Which means that the two points where I needed to bring a little energy in, or Noor needed to bring a little energy in, we managed to do it in such a way that everybody stayed on track. So, phew. <laughs> Levita. I have a question. Sure. Um, this is, some of this is from the retreat. The reading from the retreat, you mentioned that the author, some of the way he phrased things was because um, it was considered heretical during his time. Is that mm -hmm. perhaps some of the reason why the person who wrote the thing, the people who wrote the things that you discussed today, is it because some of the ideas were considered heretical or is it just, we got so used to speaking in circles that that's just what we do now? <laughs> I don't think because this was at the turn of the 20th century, right around uh, World War I thereabouts. Um, and so the ideas may have been slightly heretical, but not enough to get you killed. But I suspect that before that, they were. I know that during the time of Pythagoras, there were some things that you were sworn not to mention, like the square root of two. Good heavens. Oh, yeah, the square root of two was a nightmare for Pythagoras. <laughs> you know, everybody knows the Pythagorean theorem, right? 
Chris, tell me, tell me the yes. Yeah. We'll let Chris do the honors. Yeah. Squared plus B squared equals C squared. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the square of the hypotenuse of a right-sided triangle is equal to the sum of the other two sides, right? Everybody's heard that in school. What they and Pythagoras really dug that. Uh, he didn't invent it. He got it from Babylon, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, the Chaldeans knew that a thousand years before Pythagoras. But there is that distance uh, that is irrational in there, and it's the square root of two. And the square root of two is an irrational number. And the Pythagoreans once killed somebody for revealing this. They were so <laughs> not into anybody knowing that the universe had these little glitches because according to them, everything had a ratio. And ratio matchy, had, matchy. Yeah, yeah, every ratio uh, resolves into a whole number or a recurring decimal. But some things, like the square root of two, pi, phi, some of these numbers are completely irrational, which means they never, never, ever resolve. And that drove the Pythagoreans in particular and the Greeks in general, slightly batshit crazy. I myself love it because it's that 1% of chance in the universe. Chaos. Yeah, we need that. Without that, everything gets too sedimented. So a little bit of the irrational, and that's what irrational means. It means without ratio. doesn't mean, oh, I don't make any sense. It means I have no ratio. So I'm happy to be irrational from time to time, just like pi. I like pi. So the thing that we did right after the retreat is Noor and I split a piece of uh, key lime pie. It was pretty damn good too. Yeah, it was boutique key lime pie made <laughs> by very, very snooty people. <laughs> A piece from a pie that cost $48 for the whole pie. Wow. It was, it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. But the pie itself, A plus would eat again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was the first and probably the last time I would ever pay seven and a half dollars for a slice of pie. But welcome to the time... era of inflation. Yeah. <laughs> I think we better get used to that kind of shit. But nonetheless, I totally get what you mean. And yeah, well, my plan is get my own oven again and make my own damn mm -hmm. pies. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. So what do you think? We got anything we want to add? I don't. I'm good. Any other questions? Comments? No? Okay. Yeah. I think we did uh... okay. Okay. Brady Bunch mode. Brady Bunch mode coming. There we go. For those of us who are left. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thanks to everyone who's here and everyone watching on YouTube. Yay. Hi and bye. Take good bye. care.